Again, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to be today studying our final lesson uh, in this quarter uh, from the uh, book we call Trustworthy Sayings, Studies from the Pastoral Epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. As we mentioned last week, uh, because of a Sunday in January, we had snow and we were not able to, to meet, uh, we had to move over and uh, select lesson 13 for today's lesson. So lesson 13 is called Warnings and Charges. And we're gonna look at that this morning. Uh, Brother Bill, if I could ask you in just a minute to be ready to read uh, from our primary text. Second, yes, sir. Second Timothy four, one through five, in, in just a minute, when we get ready to do that. Second Timothy four, one through five. Uh, in, in the introduction, we, we talked about the trustworthy sayings or some versions say the faithful sayings. And At the end of the introduction, I said the same instructions and warnings, the same trustworthy sayings that the Holy Spirit guided Paul to convey for the spiritual good of Christians in the first century are just as relevant and critically important to brethren in the 21st century. We talked about instructions and warnings. Um, in today's lesson, we're going to go a little bit beyond general instructions and we're going to talk about charges. And uh, I'm going to mention briefly why I think that's one step further beyond just instructions, uh, warnings and charges. So a primary text, as we have in every one of the lessons, we have a primary text, we have other pastoral epistles references, and then a place for you to list other references from uh, scriptures outside the pastoral epistles that you believe are relevant to the lesson. So primary text from 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, Brother Bill, if you will. Okay, thank you. I charge you, therefore. Now, um, let's th let's think for just a second. If if just for purposes of illustration, uh, if the wording had been a little bit different here, without the word charge, and what follows it. Uh, the first few verses of chapter four are following what? What's the context just before chapter four, the beginning of chapter four? He's talking about what? All right, difficult times. Uh, he, he says in chapter three, verse uh, for 13, evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Continue what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and talked about the sacred writings. And that leads him into the discussion about all scripture is God, breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Talking about scripture, the sacred writings and what they're capable to do. Now, if the next thing he said Take out the word charge, leave in the therefore. If he said, therefore, preach the word. And skipping on down to verse three, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. That would be instruction, wouldn't it? Therefore, preach the word. The what word? Well, he's just been talking about that at the end of chapter three. All scripture. It's God breathed. 
Therefore, preach the word. But he didn't just say that, did he? Uh, he gives a solemn command or urging, a charging with solemnity and urgency and does it with authority. When you charge someone to do something, that indicates that you're having some, doing it with some authority, does it not? If you, you can say, do this, or you can say, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, do this. Very important. Exactly. We talked about that with the trustworthy sayings, trustworthy or faithful sayings, uh, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is profitable, as he says in verses 16 and 17. But there's some trustworthy sayings or faithful say sayings that make you sit up and take extra notice. And we've talked about that in some of these lessons. And this is one of those, it's not a saying, but it's a charge. It's an instruction that is very, very important and makes Timothy surely sit up and take extra notice, focus uh, extra energies on what he's about to say. And we do that sometimes, um, maybe just in talking to our children. But the Holy Spirit guided Paul to say, I charge you in the presence of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, you think Timothy would say, oh, this is just regular kind of instruction. I know it's not. Now, we're talking about warnings and charges. And I said in the introduction to the lesson several times in this pastoral guidance to Timothy and Titus, Paul warns of impending false teachers and their doctrines, often connecting these warnings with a solemn charge to the young ministers. Now, question one, what's the connection between the charge and the warning found in the primary text? Or is there a connection? What's, what's, we've talked about the charge, what's the warning? Okay, what, what specifically is his warning here in the text? All right, they, they don't wanna to listen to the truth. What do they want to listen to? All right. That's right. Uh, anybody reading from the, the, orig the original King James? Can you read about the itching ears? How the... For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Okay. Now, from the King James, it, it, uh, it's a little bit difficult to tell who has the itching ears. Who is it that has the itching ears? Right, right. They're saying, we don't like what, what you're saying to us. Who will tell us something that we like to hear that, that will make <laughs> us feel good? That's who we want to have talking to us. My ears need to be scratched a little bit. Uh, to hear something that we like. That's the warning here. Um, now, do you think that, that applied in the first century? Paul's telling Timothy, be careful. There's gonna be a time when people don't want the truth. They want something that makes them feel good. Do you think that ever happens today? Um, if it happened in the first century, uh, surely, if not as much, even more, it happens today. And, and as, as was read, um, we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths or fables. And he goes out, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and so forth. So the connection between the warning and the charge is 
there's going to come a time when people don't want to listen to the truth because they don't care for it. It, it makes them uncomfortable. It makes, uh, they get their toes stepped on, as we say sometimes. And so they're going to go out after something that makes them feel good. And in view of that, he gives him a solemn charge. Preach the word as, as um, the King James says, be, uh, thinks it's be instant, in season and out of season. Other versions say be ready in season and out of season. And we'll talk about be ready for what? Well, Lane, yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, they are not seeking the truth. They're seeking something that makes them feel good. And if they're not getting that, then they say the preacher has stopped preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> and I don't want to hear that anymore because that makes me uncomfortable. They're not really seeking the truth. Be ready in season and out of season. Is there a season for preaching? Okay. What's I, the, It's always in season. So what is the out of season? <laughs> uh, what, what could be considered out of season? Not so far as the preaching, but as far as the listening. Maybe. Okay. Okay. And along with the unexpectation, um, these hearers here that are, that are not, they want something just to, to make them feel good. Um, their reaction, how would that manifest itself to be characterized as out of season? We like what you're saying or... We don't like what you're saying. You used to be a good preacher, but now you're getting into some areas that we don't like too much. If it's in season, you go and preach the, pat the preacher on the back and say, amen. Keep saying what you're saying. If it's out of season, mm, no, not, not, that's right. When they, some preachers have said this means when they like it and when they don't like it. Right? Uh, and as, as Marcus says, it's when it's unexpected, sometimes it's unexpected but needs to be said anyway because it's the truth. And, and of course, the primary criterion here is is it the truth? And if it, and going back to the last of chapter three, if it's scripture, it's the truth. Because it's God breathed. And so the warning and the charge are connected in that way. Did someone else have, uh, Alan? In the history of a nation, there are times of crisis. And many times that will cause people to seek God, to, to pray, to be, have a more spiritual focus. <clears throat> and then when that crisis passes, and things return to a more normal place, Maybe even prosperity, then it's like, okay, I've got it. I don't, I don't need you. So there's the in season and out of season, perhaps. On, on a big scale, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, uh, do we ever, do we ever read about a nation in scripture that tended to be that way? <laughs> um, sometimes we talk about somebody getting fat and sassy. When things were going great for Israel, uh, they just kind of did their own thing a lot of times. But many times when things weren't going so great, they would cry to the Lord for deliverance. Like think about the period of the judges over and over again uh, that happened. And, and, and so you're right. Sometimes it happens on a national scale. Sometimes it happens that way in America. Uh, think about what happened after 9-11. You think there was some praying going on after 9-11? And, and that, looking to the Lord for help, 
um, when things are going great, uh, that kind of wanes somewhat, doesn't it? Well, let's look at question two. What two examples of false teaching does the Spirit expressly cite in the warning found in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3? Uh, someone read those three verses, if, if you would, please. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. All right. Any of this sound familiar? <laughs> Forbidding people to marry and requiring abstinence from foods. I, just even from my growing up years, which was just a short time ago, but uh, I've, I've often wondered something that's so clearly stated in Scripture, how can certain religious teachers get around something that's so explicitly said that he said, <clears throat> now the spirit expressly says, what, what, what idea do you get when the spirit expressly says? I'm kind of getting a foggy notion that maybe something's, no, he, <laughs> there's no foggy notion about anything. In latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and de teachings of demons who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods. Now, without getting into a prolonged discussion about that, whether it's these things or other things that uh, from someone who strayed from the truth, he's warning about that. And Let's look at, think about the context, especially like going back to our, our primary text, 2 Timothy chapter 4, that warning uh, that he gives there um, about the people would not endure sound teaching, but would, because of their own desires, would heap up teachers for themselves. What's the context there in uh, following that passage in 2 Timothy 4? Was that? What's the context in your own words? Is this some of Paul's initial greetings and words to, to Timothy? No, it is not. Is it instead it's what? Right. It's it's some it's some final words, is it not? Uh, look at verse six, right after we finished the primary text for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He says, he's, he's wrapping things up, uh, giving some final instructions and so forth. It's kind of like we say, okay, you've, you've come to the end of your life or near it. Are there any final things that you think are really, really important that you think need to be said? And this makes it all the more solemn warning and charges. And the one we just talked about in First Timothy, it's still, these are, are in general, even First Timothy, nearing the end of Paul's life. Not as much as Second Timothy is, but when you start thinking about as you approach the end of life, what's really important, what really needs to be said, what warnings really need to stand out and charges that go with that that need to stand out. And that's, the, that's, that's how solemn these things are and how they, important uh, they are. They would have been to, to Timothy or they should be to us as well. Ronnie. The other thing they emphasize at this point, you've already said it once to Timothy in the first letter. Now he repeats somewhat singular thing in the second letter. So this right. is something very, very important. Right. Right. And 
certainly if, if, um, if this wouldn't make him sit up and take notice, nothing would, uh, you would think. All right, 1 Timothy 6 reference. Uh, we have uh, verses 9 through 14 and then verses 17 through 19. We won't take the time to read that. But the question is, he gives a warning and two different charges in those uh, verses from 1 Timothy chapter 6. What's the connection between the warning? And, and first of all, the warning is about what? Verses 9 and 10. Okay, those who want to be rich. Why do you warn about that? What's the problem with that? Okay, it, it, when he says, um, what would be the result? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Those who are desire or want to be rich. All right. He gets two charges in the, in the following verses uh, about that warning. From, uh, verses 17 to 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them what? There's our word charge. Okay. Not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who provides richly us, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God provides us richly with everything. So it depends on where we put our trust. And our hopes, is it on the riches? Is it, I say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Or do we put our trust in God who richly provides us? And then the other charge is that the, the people, verse 18 are to be good and to do what? Rich and good works. Okay. It's, it's uh, what, where you put your trust and what you do. And we talked about that uh, in a previous lesson. So rich and good works. Uh, it's not just the things not to do, but replace those things not to do and, and where you don't put your trust into the things to do. And that is to emphasize to be rich in good works, uh, to be generous and ready to share. Generous is the opposite idea uh, that would go along with, I want to be rich. And I want to get as much as I can while I'm here. And he who dies with the most toys wins. You ever heard that one? And the opposite of that is to be rich in good works and to be generous, sharing with others instead of saying, how much can I get for myself? And that's his charge here to Timothy to pass along to other people that have gotten the wrong idea about what is to be emphasized. All right, question four. How would you explain the connection, if any, between the warning and the charge in 2 Timothy 3? That as uh, Second Timothy three one through five. <clears throat> Let me just read that. But understand this: that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather, rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. <laughs> this category of folks is not good. The, the characteristics of these time after time after time, just 
Just people that don't care about yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Avoid such people. They are very much self-centered. Now, what's the charge? Avoid them. And look at verse uh, when he says, uh, the last part of the reference is after, uh, after verses 1 through 5 is verses 14 and 15. What does he say in verses 14 and 15? Yeah, yeah. And what does that phrase begin with? What word? But, yes. Here's the contrast. These people that, that are completely self-centered, doing all these things for all the wrong motives, just thinking about themselves, and this charge to Timothy is, but, as, that's right, you be different. As for you, Continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. And then going on to what we talked about earlier, going into talking about the sacred writings, where he learned them. He says, you need to be different. That's the charge to Timothy. Sandy. Hey, That's right. Every single time I slide out the kind of language. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And and uh, the B attitudes um, are different uh, completely different from what he's talked about these people. That's the don't be attitudes. Um, and there's, there's a contrast, like the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. A lot of times in scripture we'll have contrasts like this. A warning about this, but connected with that is a charge. Don't do this, but I'm charging you, do this. And that's the same thing that, that he has here. Okay, uh, next question from Titus 1 reference. that We had uh, the uh, reference in uh, Titus 1, uh, verses 10 and 11 and verses 13 and 14. You'll turn over to Titus 1 there. What strong charge is given to Titus relative to the warning about certain false teachers? What was the warning? What was the warning that was given? Okay, against false teachers. Uh, when he says in verses 10 and 11, for there are many insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, they must be what? Silenced. That's getting to be pretty strong language, isn't it? They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful game what they ought not teach. And he talks about even some... Uh, sayings about some of the Cretans uh, and what they did. And what's the strong charge that he gives uh, beginning in verse um, verse 13. Rebuke them sharply. What, what image comes to your mind or, or what, what do you think about when you think about rebuking someone sharply? Do you, do you, get, the, do you get the idea of saying, mm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I'm, I'm seeing it a little bit differently. Is that the image that comes to your mind? Not to mine. What does it mean to rebuke someone? All right, all right, there's a confrontation, isn't there? Don't be so confrontational. Well, sometimes that's probably good advice. But in this situation, it's not good advice. You have to confront someone sometimes. 
not only just rebuke them, but he says, rebuke them sharply. What, when, you're, when you're done, should that person realize that they've been rebuked? <laughs> uh, my reading of this is, yes, they will know I've been rebuked. Now, uh, as we noted from our lesson talking about uh, rightly handling the word of truth, um, we can, that there's there's a, a right way and a wrong way to rightly handle the word of well no that's not the correct way is to rightly handle the word of truth, uh, and we do that with patience uh, towards someone. But you can be patient with someone and still rebuke them sharply. He said, these people must be silenced. You, there's certain things he's saying, I think, clearly to Titus here. This cannot continue. And I'm telling you, you cannot let it be, continue. You have to put some things to silence. Now, that can be done uh, in a spirit of love. Because I love you and you're my brother and I don't want your soul to be lost over this. Or it can be done in an ugly way that doesn't show any love. But it's still, it's a sharp rebuke. And there, clearly, from what Paul is saying to Titus here, there are times for that. And you can't just sweep it under the rug and say, well, that's your opinion, but I don't necessarily share that opinion. Yes, Ronnie. Go back to 2 Timothy 4. You, know, again, you have that same word for you. I don't know whether it's the same in Greek or not. But you have it in the English. Preach the word against the innocent house. Re reprove. Prove what is right. Rebuke. Prove what is wrong. So it is to say what's right, and then it's to say it's wrong. Is the idea of rebuke. This is wrong. Here is why it's wrong. All right. And leave no uncertainty about that right yeah. and uh, th that's to be done very clearly and there are there are times for that not all the time but there are certainly times for that because he said that this is something that if allowed to continue uh, is uh, he says these kind of things upset whole families And he, there's several, this, this whole lesson is about the warnings and charges that are given. That certain things cannot continue. The, the warning said that, well, like he talks about the Hymenaeus and Philetus, who said the resurrection is, is already passed, it's already come. He said they're upsetting people's faith and causing people to swerve from the truth. Is that a small matter? No, he says that cannot continue. Yes, sir, did you? That's right. Yeah. Some, sometimes there's a grain of truth in things people say, but he, he said, if, it, if here's the truth and here's the error, and there's a clear distinction between that, one of them has got to fall and the truth has to stand and the error uh, has to fall. Uh, and, and, Result of that. All right. What? Yes. Right. You're, you're exactly right. Uh, doing this is one thing. Saying it's an easy thing to do is another thing. It's not an easy thing to do. And especially to Timothy and to Titus, who were younger Preachers, one of, the, one of the things he says to Timothy is don't let anybody despise you for what? Your youth. Wait a minute. 
what are you, what are you, 25 years old, 30 years old, and you're going to tell me what this is all about? Why, I was doing this and this and this, this before you were even born. That's the despising that sometimes can happen. But so was Timothy say, okay, well, if that's going to be the case, then I'll just keep my mouth shut. No, he couldn't do that. Titus couldn't do that. You can't. Some people have to be silenced, but you're right. It's hard to do it in the right way. And that comes with some careful uh, consideration of our words before they come out of our mouth, which I don't always do. Uh, but, but and and some wisdom and experience. We hopefully get better at that as we mature. Yeah, Matt, there. just one second, Sorry. Matt. The, uh, earlier when you were talking about I charge you to preach this way, right? It's it's interesting that that may apply to everyone. It certainly applied to Timothy. Later, he says, come visit me as soon as possible. Well, that, right. that doesn't apply to me. I'm, you know, right? But our preachers surely should follow those general instructions. And we always say that as a congregation, we should want that kind of preaching, right? Well, here, yeah. to Titus, when he's saying, you know, rebuke them severely, that may apply to everyone. Maybe everyone isn't prepared to go rebuke everyone severely, but we all ought to be ready to receive that kind of rebuke yeah. in the right way when it's needed. And that's yeah. really, really hard. But that applies to every single person. That's right. In the that's right uh, at one point he says to Timothy the things I've uh, said to you among faithful witnesses, witnesses commit to others who will be able to teach others also so this is to spread yes their instructions are directly given to Timothy and to Titus but they are to go to others as well as the gospel message is spread and we all have to be ready for the defense of the gospel to be ready always as Peter said to give an answer uh, for the hope that is within us with love that's right uh, with all long suffering uh, we're told um, did you have something Patty yeah I mean, the, this whole thing is the elders got to do things the deacon got to do things uh, we have to do things all of those good things that God expects us to do you can read it. there's a lot of men in this congregation that are elders, and and you know we have to respect that. But you know you just treat people the right way with love. If you're going to rebuke somebody, they got to know that they love you. And I, you know, the love has to be there. They, you can't go up to somebody and yeah, yeah. Like, 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 yeah. Well, right, and and uh, again, uh, the the purpose with which we with which we do this has to be evident. You remember we talked earlier about some things to avoid and we talked about 1 Corinthians 5 and Paul talks, rebukes the Corinthians. He rebuked them and they knew that they had been rebuked about tolerating this man for uh, who was guilty of gross immorality within the church. Uh, he said to deliver such a one to Satan for what reason? To show that you put him in his place? No, that the spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. Uh, the purpose is to try to save somebody's soul uh, in this, not to say, well, I showed them. Uh, all right, we don't have time for the final question, but um, can somebody just tell me one other warning and associated charge found in scripture? What did, uh, just get a couple of examples. Outside the pastoral epistles. Okay, which says? Okay, that's good. Don't do this, but do that. Uh, one that I put down that immediately came to my mind, Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel than that which we, you have, we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Thank you all for your attention, for your contributions. I hope the study has been a profitable one for you. It certainly has been for me. And we'll be beginning a new quarter of study 
next Lord's Day. Thank you.